In the last lecture, we tried to answer the question, what is a patient, by looking into deep time, looking far into the evolutionary past. However, that person who might be sitting in front of you in the clinic, or is part of your sample in your research program, also has a more recent past, and that recent past makes quite a difference. Our relationship to chimpanzees and bonobos is now pretty well understood. This is their distribution. There are basically four different kinds of chimpanzees. They are living in Western Africa, in Cameroon and Gabon. There are, is a little separate type that lives in southeastern Nigeria, and then there is the eastern chimpanzee that lives in much of the eastern Congo and over into Uganda. The bonobo lives inside the bend of the Congo River. It's the purple spot there. If we look at the time now that we look, now that we have the entire genome of these organisms sequenced, we can be pretty precise. We share 95 percent of our genome with both bonobos and chimpanzees. Bonobos and chimpanzees share about 1.8 of their genome with each other more closely than they do with humans. The BCH here is bonobo, chimpanzee, human. Chimpanzees and humans share about 1.6 percent of their genome more closely than they do with bonobos. And uh, no, excuse me, this is on this one, it's humans and bonobos sharing their genome more closely than they do with chimpanzees. The branch comes off more recently here. And this is the case, 1.7 percent, where humans and chimpanzees share that much of their genome more closely than with bonobos. Putting that all together, uh, we diverged from chimpanzees and bonobos roughly 4.5, maybe 5 million years ago, and they diverged from each other only about a million years ago. Nevertheless, they differ significantly in, in a number of their traits. Here are some human traits that we have acquired in the last five million years that chimpanzees don't have. We, our brains, grow for a long time after we are born, and uh, our myelinization pattern in our brain is delayed. That gives us more learning plasticity and rewiring possibilities uh, during the first seven years of our development, which seems to give us enhanced cognition. We have larger brains. Our larynx has descended in our throat, and that is associated with improved capacity to uh, control sound and therefore language. We have a higher density of sweat glands, and that gives us better sweating capacity, and therefore we can cool off when we're running better. We have improved energy use with uh, long periods of endurance running. So we are capable, actually, of running down antelope until they collapse from exhaustion, if we're in good shape. Uh, during childbirth, our human labor has an earlier onset and it lasts longer, and this seems to have protected the child and the mother from the damage that occurs because of the difficulties of human childbirth. We can cry. We have lacrimation. That increases our range of emotional communication response. We have relatively uh, reactive T cells in our adaptive immune system, and our thumb is a bit longer. It's a little bit more distal. It has larger muscles, and that gives us better fine motor skill and, and ability to manipulate tools. Other things. Our, our infants are more helpless, more altricial when they're born. We are capable of having them at shorter intervals. That probably is because we have more social support for child care. We have delayed maturation, so uh, we are older when we, come, when we become ready to reproduce. Humans have menopause, chimpanzees do not, and we live 20 or 30 years longer. So there's been a whole series, a whole syndrome of changes about what it means to be human that have evolved in the last five million years. Now, once humans have evolved, which they did in Eastern and Southern Africa, they then moved out of Africa and colonized the planet, and they colonized it at different times. And it's important to realize that as they did so, they encountered different environments, both environments of pathogens and things to eat. 
and their bodies changed in response, in evolutionary response to encountering different pathogens and different diets. We know that Africa is the source because it contains more genetic diversity than the whole rest of the planet combined. In one village in West Africa, you can find differences between individual human beings which are as large as the differences between Frenchmen and Russians. So it is pretty clear that humans came out of Africa. And as we migrated, we encountered different environments. And in the process, we left behind some diseases. We leave behind diseases because uh, directly transmitted diseases cannot maintain themselves in small human populations. They sweep through the population. Everybody develops, who survives develops immunity. And then the disease dies out because there's no one left to infect until the next baby is born. So you can imagine hunter-gatherers moving across the Bering Strait or going out in canoes across the Pacific. And if everyone is an adult and there are no babies being born for a couple of years, then the diseases that uh, are directly transmitted would die out. That would include measles, smallpox, plague, and influenza, and typhus. So essentially, the New World and Polynesia didn't have those diseases. They were African and Eurasian diseases maintained in larger populations. So one, react, one, one real important result of this diaspora across the globe is huge variation in ability to resist disease and to metabolize drugs. Now, the basic fact about humans is that we're all nearly identical genetically. But our genome is so large that both of these statements are true. I am genetically 99.9% .9 identical to you. That means we share 99.9% .9 of 3.3 billion nucleotides. But my genome differs from yours at up to 3.3 million positions, which is 0.1% of 3.3 billion. So both of those things are true. We have a little difficulty thinking about it because they're big numbers, but they're both true. So the first statement shows how conservative inheritance is, and the second points to flexibility. Now. Not all nucleotide changes are equivalent. As we've discussed, some are neutral, some alter the structure of a single protein, some change control over large genetic networks and are key control genes in development. The genetic differences among humans, among these 3.3 million positions, are of all these types. So let's take a direct look at that. This is from a study that's now classic, published in 2008 by Lee and colleagues at Stanford. And they looked at 928 individuals from 51 populations around the globe. And they examined 650,000 single nucle nucleotide polymorphisms. That means a sing one of those would be a place in the genome where somewhere in the population, one person has one nucleotide and another person has another nucleotide. They then detected ancestry and population structure. You'll see in a moment that the relationship between the genetic information and geography was consistent with a single origin in sub-Saharan Africa. And this is the most comprehensive characterization to date of human variation on the planet. So to look at this, the x-axis here just arranges the different population samples. So these are the different groups. You will see here uh, things like San, those are the pygmies of Namibia. You'll see Bedouin, so those are nomads in North Africa. French, uh, you'll see Pathan and so forth. These are people in South Central Asia. Over here we have East Asia. Over here we have Native Americans in North and in South America. And then in blue here we have Polynesia and Papua New Guinea. The vertical axis actually is 650,000 nucleotides long. Uh, it snips long. It has 650,000 different possible positions. So that's a huge amount of information characterized by the vertical axis. And then each line on that axis is one human individual. So there are 928 lines across this. And they have been grouped together by a program called Structure, which tries to find 
the most natural points at which you can group things, and it does so without first looking at their identity. It just takes the data and says these are the natural groups. And it can identify a group of people in Africa, a group of people in Europe that are in green, a group of people in Asia who are blue, and a group of people in East Asia who are orange here. And then in uh, North and South America, a group of people in purple. And what you can see is that people in the Middle East actually have genomes where an individual person will be a mixture of people who are Middle Eastern and European and Central Asian. That's the meaning of the different colors here. Here is a group of people, the Russians, who are mostly European but who have some Central Asian and some East Asian and some genes that eventually ended up in North America. That's that little purple blip right there in the Russian population. If we make that into a phylogenetic tree, this is the same data, differently displayed, what we see is a pattern of, of worldwide human relationships that has its origin in Africa, Bantu, Pygmy, Yoruba, Mandenka. So these are people who are in Central and Western Africa and South Africa. Then there's a very long uh, branch here. That means there was a long period of time, and that was about 100,000 years ago. There was a group of people that came out. They settled in the Middle East. Those were the Druze, Palestinians, Bedouins, and Mozabites. And then they radiated out over the globe. So here are the Europeans, here are the Central Asians, here are the East Asians, here are the people who are in uh, North and South America, and here are the Papua New Guinea and Melanesian people here. So this point where they go into North America is about 14,000 years ago. This point here where they move out of the Middle East and they move into East Asia is about 40,000 years ago. Interestingly, the last Neanderthals died out 35,000 years ago. That means that there was a long period of coexistence. During that period, we hybridized with Neanderthals. And if you like big furry mammals, the last mammoth died out about 2,500 to 4,500 years ago and could easily have been seen by Europeans in recorded history if they had gone up into central Russia. Now, this is the same data, and we're going to break it out a different way. What this just shows you is that if we look at the amount of variation within populations and then among groups within, uh, uh, within larger groups and then among the larger groups, so these would be the largest groups, Africa, Middle Eastern, European, and then these would be the smaller groups within each of those. So we're asking how much of the variation in humans is a result of the fact that they're African, how much of it is results from the fact that they're some kind of African, and so forth. Then we see here a breakout for the X chromosome and for autosomes and for microsatellites. That's a particular kind of repeated DNA that's scattered through the genome. And the important thing is actually this break here. You'll notice there's a break between 15 and 100 on the vertical axis. This bar, which represents variation among individuals within populations is the biggest bar in all three cases. That means that most human genetic differences are between individuals. If we look at how genetically variable people are and we graph that against distance to Addis Ababa, so using Ethiopia as the center of the process, we see that in Africa they're quite variable and the farther away we get from Africa, the less genetically variable they are. So these points are all from North and South America. This is East Asia. This is Africa up here. That means that as humans moved out and away from Africa, they went through a repeated series of founder events that reduced their genetic variation. If we then ask, well, can we make groups out of people just based on their genes? The answer is yes, we can. We can see that the Sardinians are different from the Tuscans, and we can see that the Italians are different from the Russians. And if we look into the Middle East, we can see that the Druze 
are the different from the Mozabites and that the Bedouins are different from both of them. Okay, so there is some genetic basis to ethnic variation. But the thing I want to call your attention to is how little of the variation is explained by that. So if you take all of human variation and you ask, well, these kinds of differences, how much are they explaining? Differences in this direction are explaining 1.6% and differences in this direction are explaining 2.4% for this case. And it's about 5% and 2.5% in this case. In other words, yes, if we have an, a big enough sample, we can make fine discriminations, but in the overall pattern, there really isn't that big a genetic difference between these sorts of people. This sort of thing has been done now for about 40 years. It was first done with uh, proteins, and then it was done with microsatellites in the 90s, and now with SNPs uh, about five years ago. And the conclusion is quite robust. About 84 to 89 percent, that's this column here, of genetic differences among humans are among individuals. Only 6 to 11 percent are among groups that could be described as races. So these are populations, say, within Europe. These are populations within Africa. These are differences between Africans and Europeans. The basic point here is that most human genetic variation is between individuals. Now, what does that mean? Let's take a look at one characteristic that we often think of as being associated with what we call race, skin color. Our primate ancestors, chimpanzees and bonobos, had light skin under dark hair. Their exposed skin was light at birth and it darkened with age. About two to three million years ago, we evolved black skin because we lost our, our, uh, our hair. We became naked apes. And we evolved black skin to protect against skin cancer and against folate depletion. And that also improved our ability to sweat and cool us down. We had probably become long distance runners to run down prey. So when did we evolve other skin co colors? Well, probably between about 100,000 and 10,000 years ago. In some cases, we evolved light skin fairly quickly as we moved into countries, into climates where we wore clothes, to improve vitamin D synthesis. So skin color is actually a fairly superficial trait. It's coded by a small number of genes. It can evolve quickly. It's caught in a trade-off between the benefits of vitamin D and the cost of folate depletion. And it's also involved with in mediating skin cancer. So in this discussion of recent things that have happened in our past that help us to understand the question, what is a patient? We can see that we've evolved many changes uh, in traits since we shared ancestors with chimpanzees and bonobos. Many of these traits are medically significant. We came out of Africa about 100,000 years ago, and as we moved across the planet, we encountered environments that had different diets and diseases. We evolved genetic differences in disease resistance and drug metabolism. Both of them are now quite variable. There are no biological races. Race is a social construct. But there are genetic differences associated with ethnicity that contain useful medical information. And we will see some of those in future lectures.